Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. If Francis is trying to do anything, it's to force upon the church a realization that the church was wrong in the past. It isn't true, of course, since the church is the spotless bride of Christ. The church itself has never erred. But it is Francis's aim nonetheless. What was the church wrong about before that he is trying to fix? Aside from the liturgy, which I've covered in the past few days ad nauseum, and I'm certainly going to be covering more in the coming days, the church was wrong, according to his view, because it excluded people based on, well, sin. The church had standards and demanded that people leave their lives of sin behind them, pick up their crosses and follow our blessed Lord. Now, Francis's message is, dare we hope all men are saved, as he puts the church on notice that all are welcome, and not just are all welcome because the church has always been welcome to any repentant sinner. It's that now we won't ask you to stop sinning either, unless you're a traditional Catholic, of course. <laughs> Let's talk about the message Francis sent in both his recent announcement of new cardinals, as well as the message he sent when he finally weighed in on the big court happening in America that happened on June 24th. So let's get started. What we're talking about here, folks, is faithlessness. We're talking about replacing the faith with a secular ideology, a vision of the church that turns the church into a glorified social services agency. And while the corporal works of mercy, those acts of charity, feeding the, feeding the poor, helping visiting prisoners, all of that, those things, of course, we are commanded to do by our Lord. But there's a common theme we see in the critics of traditional Catholics, and we see coming from the modernists more broadly as what the church should do is simply a materialist ideology, a focus of turning the faith into something material. And that's why you see the things that we're going to talk about right now. And let's start with the latter. Our story takes us to Vatican City. St. Peter's Basilica specifically, which I know you heard about this because everyone heard about this, because on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, Francis did a number of things. On the first, the first thing he did was he issued a new document chastising the laity and clergy for being loyal to the same liturgy as our ancestors. But on the same day that he did that, he said a mass, and the woman that I have to call here, Lady Moloch, was in attendance. And not only did Lady Moloch receive the Eucharist in defiance of Archbishop Cordeleone's orders, who is her ordinary and has the ecclesiastical authority to do such things, and he did that because of her stance on the, uh, shall we say, Moloch ritual, but she was photographed doing so, and then was photographed greeting Francis personally. That was Francis sending a message. He is himself a supporter of the Moloch ritual. That's why the Vatican only had vaguely positive sounding words about the big court happening a few days earlier. It is worth noting, though, that just over the weekend, after I recorded the initial version of this, actually, so this is an edit, Francis did say something very similar to the things he said in the past about the Moloch ritual, things that are vaguely Catholic sounding, though he said he didn't actually read the text of the actual decision itself which is a little odd given the gravity of it and how it dominated the headlines, but he did say something positive. So I will give him that much credit where it's due, I guess. But he did still host Lady Moloch for the mass. The Catholic News Agency reported on this and they used the Associated Press. And according to the AP, Lady Moloch was seated specifically in the part of the Basilica Reserve for diplomats, meaning everyone knew there who she was since logically she'd have to identify herself before being permitted to sit in the VIP section. And the AP made sure everyone, including the Catholic News Agency, knew that she met with Francis afterwards. And pictures were taken and published. They were clearly photo ops. That was a purposeful message. I'd cover this story more in depth, but it's already kind of old and really only serves to remind us that Francis has been sending messages to the Catholic world for a while now. And those messages are that the moral deposit of the faith doesn't really matter. What really matters is group hugs and welcoming everyone. And so if the moral deposit of the faith doesn't matter to him, we should really try to understand what this means, what he really wants. And what he really wants is inclusion. The purpose of the Synodal Way, his silly synod of synods, or his de facto Third Vatican Council, as I've been calling it now for the past year, its whole purpose is to make sure to welcome everyone without that one requirement that the church has always had. Go forth and sin no more. 
We're not in the business of telling sinners to pick up their crosses and follow our Lord. Not anymore. Except for traditional Catholics who sin against Vatican II. Francis said that <laughs> in some way or another. And that's really the only group, we, that meaning you and I, who are told to, you know, go forth and sin no more. Meaning we have to get with the times and accept what the church teaches on everything. And by the church, we mean the modernists. Anyway, newwalden.org really nailed this with Francis's new elevations. Have you forgotten about those already? Remember, he's got 21 new cardinals, 16 of whom can participate in the next papal conclave. And most of them are sort of the cream of the crop of wicked modernists. According to New Walden, and they're a very accurate take on this, the purpose of the synod is the abandoning of the moral teachings of the church in favor of group hugs and inclusion. From their article, quote, by now you've heard that the Pope is getting ready to install 21 new cardinals and that people are worried about these new appointments. They should be. One prime suspect is the Bishop of San Diego, Robert McElroy. The new cardinal's recent interview with America Magazine is a pack of lies. Take a look at this excerpt. Bishop McElroy cited, his own efforts to support the Pope's vision for a more synodal church, one that is characterized by a more pastoral orientation rather than a strict doctrinal orientation within the life of the church, as he put it. Bishop McElroy said he and the Pope share a view that the church should focus on more inclusion and outreach to people who have been alienated from the church in the past. The big lies in that except com excerpt come down to three loaded dog whistles for, for progressive Christians, pastoral, synodal, and inclusion. End quote. In the first year of this podcast, I did an episode on modernist lingo. It was a silly video that some people took too seriously at the time, so I haven't bothered to revisit the kind of more lighter hearted, humorous subject matter generally, but maybe I should do a follow up because the whole sentence was full of modernist lingo. And it's hard to decipher what the modernists mean when they say things like the church should have a pastoral orientation. What does it actually mean? The church has always had a pastoral orientation. Pastoral in the Christian sense just means giving or focusing on providing spiritual direction and assistance. That sounds like virtually all of the history of the faith to me. The term pastoral has come to mean something else, though, and New Walden gives us insight into that. Quote, inclusion is the goal. I think we should start with McElroy's comment on inclusion. And let's use some common sense here. How could the church be any more inclusive than it already is? Every church I have ever attended, with one possible exception, always resembled a model United Nations. There's an obvious reason for that. The Catholic Church is represented all around the world. It is truly a universal church, which is what Catholic actually means. Parish picnics have introduced me to food from all over the world, and masses at my parishes have been conducted in many languages, including Spanish, Tagalog, and Igbo. One parish even had a mass conducted all in sign language for the deaf. Is a fact that the Catholic Church has been preached to every continent of the earth. The only way it could be more inclusive is if, is if it was started baptizing penguins of Antarctica, end quote. And of course, that's a joke. He doesn't actually call for baptizing penguins. But the author goes on to describe what is actually meant to be inclusive. The Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church topic, that is what is meant by inclusion. It's a modern heresy that goes back to the 70s at the very least, where New Way's ministry and similar groups were pushing a rejection of the inerrancy of sacred scripture by saying that the Jimmy Martin sin didn't really cry out to heaven for vengeance. That St. Paul was wrong and that the church needs to just get with the times. That not only that, but that the church actually needs to lead the push to get the world to accept this stuff. Yes, it goes back 50 years at least for pretty much the entire history of the post-Vatican II era of the church, which I'm sure is not a coincidence. Bishop McElroy has himself said that the church's teaching and the catechism on this topic needs to change, and Amoris Laetitia points the way to doing that by the document's own admission, though something called the logic of integration, which simply means putting aside dogma, morality, and doctrine for making people feel better about themselves. There can be no other reason for that but feelings, because if you deny the importance or accuracy of dogma, morality, and doctrine, all you have left is feelings. Several bishops have realized this and have used a Morris Letizia to publicly call for the church's teaching to change. And if they succeed in getting the institutions of the church to promote error publicly, then they put the great apostasy in the church on full display for the whole world to see. St. Anthony Mary Claret tells us what is really going on when we get pastors like this. We are being punished. 
punished for our sins, for our worldliness, for our lukewarmness, for our failure to spread the gospel, for our own failure to, to, to actually live what we profess. Here's what St. Mary Anthony Claret says, quote, If you see a bad priest at the head of a parish, you should be afflicted in fear that perhaps our sins deserve such a horrible chastisement. For sacred scripture teaches us that the greatest and most terrible scourge that God sends to a people is to give it bad priests. Until the wrath of the Lord reaches its apex, he permits that nations arm themselves one against another, that the fields become sterile, that hunger, desolation, and death exert their dominion over the earth. However, when his just indignation reaches its climax, he sends the last and most atrocious of his punishments by allowing unfaithful ministers, stained priests, scandalous shepherds to appear among men. Then it happens that the abominations of the people are the cause of the bad priests, and the bad priests are the greatest punishment with which God chastises people. End quote. If that all sounds familiar, well, it should. That's the world we're living in. Made all the worse because not only do we have bad priests in some parishes, certainly not all, but in far more than we should have sent by simple statistical probabilities, we also have had a string of bad pontiffs and the countlessly bad bishops. We're being punished for our sins. I know that's a great message to kick you in the face with today, but it's the truth. If you want to fix the church, start with yourself and with your family. I bring you these messages so you'll pray more, that you'll pray for the church and seek sanctity. You'll pray for these bishops that I'm talking about, Bishop McElroy today, Francis always. But get praying more. Get your, yourself and your family praying more. Adopt a pious traditional devotion. Fast. Pray and do acts of penance. This is July, and the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel is coming, and I have a perfect video in the works for that because it shows that most of us who think we've lived the Fatima message aren't living the Fatima message because we've all not done one critical thing and it's tied to that feast day. I'll have that video a few days ahead of the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel so you can take advantage of that feast day to rectify this part of your Catholic life if you really want to do your part in fulfilling the Fatima message. But I have to ask, is the author of New Walden correct? Is this just a push to get the church to accept the Pastor Jimmy Martin topic? We've seen that in the German Synodal Way and in various national synodal reports for, from different parts of the church in recent weeks. So let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with his assessment. Is this really about the Jimmy Martin topic almost exclusively? I tend to think he's on the money, but I do think there's more to it than that that they, meaning the modernist prelates in Rome, and especially Francis, are trying to put the faith at the service of the secular elites, which I think is obvious at this point. But let me know what you think of this in the comments. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.